Hello, and welcome to this Potnosis episode of Talknosis. Today we're going to be talking about a series of video games, The Elder Scrolls. I'm Jason Memmel, and I'm joined with our frequent guest, Nick, Nick Lachetti. Hey, Nick. Hey, how's it going, Jason? Not too bad. So uh, if you're joining us for the first time, maybe because you're interested in The Elder Scrolls, and if you're new to Gnosticism, the absolute shortest way I can describe it is a kind of deeper knowing, something that you can't be, you can't, uh, be taught or learn directly, but that you can discover or remember through faith, mystical exploration, or my purpose, personal favorite, art. It can be described as remembering a deep connection, one that you didn't know you forgot. And a lot of classical traditions throughout many years have whole cosmologies of figures that are either trying to keep us from remembering, or at the very least are in the way of remembering. On Pop Gnosis, we take a look at the culture around us through a Gnostic lens. Sometimes the connections are direct and easy to see. Sometimes they're lurking just underneath and need to be uncovered with a little bit of digging and exploration. So that's what we're doing here. And uh, to, go, to get into the, the text we're talking about here, we're going to be talking about the Elder Scrolls, mostly a series of open world fantasy role playing games where the player can develop a character of their own and uh, of their own choosing and explore a fantasy world called Tamriel. So there are quests and dangers, but the player is often able to approach them in any order and with any method they choose as relates to their character skills. There's like five main games so far, uh, Arena, Daggerfall, Morrowind, Oblivion, and Skyrim. Starting with Daggerfall, the background lore of the setting started to take on some unique elements, such as divine beings and demigods that didn't look like a, like a traditionally pagan pantheon or, or a monotheistic one. And by Morrowind, a truly interesting flavor to the world began to take hold. Uh, most of the action is on a volcanic island with inhabitants and cultures that are non-human. A lot of lore and concepts are only hinted at, but it points to a meta-textual conception in which some of the gods are aware they're inside of a video game. This doesn't directly influence the game plot, and many players didn't actually discover or engage with this. Oblivion and Skyrim return to a more traditional or European form of fantasy setting, but much of the earlier concepts remain and become referenced to. The Elder Scrolls, originally positioned as just a historical record, become a text that sits outside of the reality of the game world and can influence it. And along with all of this, there has become a dedicated fan base that explore and debate the lore of this setting, including and especially the metatextual elements. Uh, I'll also mention here maybe that those, uh, that those fan bases have collected a lot of the in-game texts. This game, uh, or this whole series of games rather, has a lot of books that you can pick up off of shelves in the game and choose to read. A lot of players don't choose to do this because they don't want to sit reading a book when they want to be you know, fighting dragons. But uh, a lot of this lore is is literally just sitting there on the shelf for somebody to pick up and read. Um, so yeah, so that's the that's the uh, the 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 quick synopsis of it. And um, we like we already kind of prepared some questions and stuff like that. But actually, Nick, I wanted to maybe start with something a little more personal. Like um, uh, when we connected over this, like you already had a familiarity and an understanding of the Elder Scrolls. Or have you played these games? Yeah, so I mean, I started playing, I think, unfortunately, I would like to say Morrowind was the first one I played, because that's kind of the coolest one in this context. But I played Oblivion, I was like 16. Um, and I remember playing in my friend's house. And, you know, it was just, for me, it was what was incredible about it. And now I think open world games is a much more common kind of format. But at the time, mm -hmm. just the ability to create any type of character and go anywhere, I just felt like this incredible possibility in the world. So I really loved it. So then I played Skyrim a little later, more as an adult. Um, I've tried to play Skyrim every so often for a few years. Um, and then I, I did go back to Morrowind as well and some of the earlier ones. So yeah, I've been playing them for the last 20 years, I guess. Ah, cool. Yeah, and I've been playing them a long time too. I, yeah. I did actually start with Daggerfall. And oh, yeah, then, um, yeah, like, you know, uh, cause sort of an old school and, and that's not a humble brag. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's just, you know, just sort of my, my chronology here, but like, and then I did play Morrowind and um, uh, a, a little bit of Oblivion, but actually Skyrim is the first one I ever finished. Um, mm. Just where, where my life was with, when I came across these games, I didn't have a ton of a ton of extra time. And then the the time in my life where I was playing Skyrim, I happened to have some extra time <laughs> and played the played the way through. But I think like your your point about um, it being exciting to explore, that's the thing I think that really strikes me about about the, the experience in all of these games is that 
after kind of initially giving you the general sense of how the game works, mm -hmm. it pretty commonly puts the, they like each game pretty commonly puts you in a place where it's you choose then which direction you want to go without yep. a lot of really rigid rules. Like you have, if you want to follow the story, it's you, it's really easy to do that. Like you're not, um, you're not abandoned without any guidance, but, um, but you're also not forced in any way. And people often just choose to go, go left instead of going right kind of thing. Yeah, I feel like when I played them, you know, I, I think that this is different in modern games where now there's a lot of map. You know, I've been talking to my partner about this as well. She's been playing Pokemon, <laughs> the newer <laughs> Pokemon games, which are open world pretty much now. But everything's kind of, you know, mapped out. If you're following like a point on a map all the time, like there's, uh, I don't know if anybody's played like Cyberpunk or some any of these more modern open world games, but a lot of things are kind of given to you about, you know, where quests are and things like that. But Elder Scrolls, I mean, yeah, like you said, um, you know, once you're pushed out from the beginning of the game, usually you're like a prisoner or, you know, mm -hmm. you're something like that. And then you just, you don't have to go anywhere specifically. I almost never went to the main quest. I would just wander for, you know, the entire time I played it pretty much. <laughs> um, and that, that was kind of amazing. I mean, I remember playing Oblivion and then even that game, which I think is not generally considered one of the best ones, but, um, I think my character, you know, ended up went to like a bar or a tavern or something and then ended up like captured by pirates. And this is like the first 20 minutes. I was like, wow, this is this stuff is just happening to me. So yeah, yeah that feeling of the world being real was pretty intense. Um, you know, even something like, uh, uh, cause I, I too often like to explore, but then I do also feel like this sort of in-game narrative mm -hmm. drive to, uh, to follow the main quest because like the world is counting on me. I better, I better do my job, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I think that that's actually kind of an interesting, like, uh, um, you know, a, a reflection perhaps of my own, my own spiritual path, because like on one hand, I love to explore and I love to like try things out and look under nooks and crannies. And like, I, I'm a bit like a magpie that way. I'm like, I'm picking up esoteric stuff all the time that I'm interested in. Uh, without always necessarily going deep in one particular path. But then there is a part of me that does feel like, well, no, I should be faithful to a particular path. I should follow one single path. Like, um, and it's like, I'm always within that tension. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, which maybe this is also yeah. kind of a way to segue a bit into the, into the, the, some of these more esoteric kind of qualities. Like I wouldn't say that, um, that the esoteric qualities of, of Elder Scrolls were like immediately popped up to me, like as I started playing the games. But I think the fact, like, and we alluded to this in the synopsis, the, the fact that there isn't just like gods that map onto like, say a Greek pantheon or mm -hmm. gods that are, are like clearly like something we've seen before, like say from Lord of the Rings or, or some like tentpole fantasy concepts. Um, like I remember even in Daggerfall, it, it seemed a little, alien like a little weird yeah. if that makes sense uh -huh. um and i think that always kind of tickled me as well um yeah uh but it was actually it wasn't until skyrim that i think i was like oh there's some really fascinating weirdness here um yeah, yeah. uh did you do the quest there's a quest where you go to like a, a, a another dimension called apocrypha yeah is apocrypha the the books the library yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Yeah. Which, like, at this point, you're now in like a like a, a, a George Borgesian, yeah, um, like landscape of like you know like a, a dungeon made of books and a mm -hmm. weird like demon god that is like basically a floating eye and tentacles, but like so much, so much more complicated than just like a, a, a mapping of a Lovecraft god into a D and D world, like. Uh -huh. Um, and yeah, so then I was like, okay, there's something here. And I think that's probably where I really started digging deeper. Um, yeah. What about you? I mean, for me, I think, so I, I do like the in-game text and that, so part of it that's fun, and it is funny. I know a lot of players don't actually, you know, engage with that and could just play these games as kind of straight fantasy kind of role-playing games, uh, mm -hmm. because you do end up and we'll probably talk about it, but if you're into those texts, you start and, and until I found that you could read them online because people uploaded them. I think they've released books of them now in real life, mm -hmm. like hardcover books, <laughs> but yeah, but I don't have them, but, um, but you know, I used to spend so much time just like opening the menu and reading the books. That I was like, that was taking up a lot of my game playing time for this. Yeah. So it was partly that I, I did discover that pretty fast, but then another thing about it was, you know, I went to college and started doing religious studies and, 
really, you know, part of my background is, is in the reason I got interested in kind of Gnosticism, Christianity and all that is because of uh, late antique religion. So mm -hmm. Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, patristic theology, all that sort of stuff. And I started noticing a lot of parallels with that pretty quickly, just from what mm -hmm. I remembered from playing Oblivion a few years before that when I was in high school, which mm -hmm. was that, uh, you know, the especially in Oblivion, there's a lot about the emperor and it, it could just be a traditional fantasy you know, the, the king or something. But in Elder Scrolls, it's really not like that. It's it's, it's very specifically a kind of, uh, um, I don't know what the right word would be, a kind of an XP of a Roman Empire situation. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and not only that, and not just kind of the basic imperial sort of stuff, but also the really complex ideas about the divinization of the emperor. Um, you know, the past emperors are gods that has mm. this complicated theological and metaphysical meaning in the universe and there's theological debates about it that cause wars in the game especially between the high elves and the humans so stuff like that i started to notice so like oh there's a lot of texture here totally well and and i think like uh you know actually i i i saw there was sort of the the general roman theming particularly yeah. i noticed it mostly in in uh, uh morrowind like the mm -hmm. the armor oh, for yeah. the for the empire is like clearly roman um uh but but one thing I think is is uh, interesting is like I didn't connect it with the Roman divinization of emperors mm. idea. Like, um, uh, but now that you say it, it makes complete sense. Um, while at the same time, and like so many things in the Elder Scrolls, it's never one answer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, it's more like a, like a playful um, a playful exploration there. Um, mm -hmm. So I wonder, like. Uh, I didn't put this in our synopsis, uh, but maybe we should actually do a quick synopsis if if it's at all possible yeah. of some of the, there are some like, um, I would say generally agreed upon mythological frameworks mm -hmm. within the Elder Scrolls. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this idea of like how the universe was generally created um, that we think kind of maps on pretty easily to Gnosticism. Do you want to take a crack at that? Do you want me to take a crack at that? Uh, I could start. So okay. it's, it's, it was complicated. So I think one of the things about this and before people kind of jump on us on the internet or something is that, <laughs> you know, all of this, and I think you already alluded to it is that, and I think maybe one of the, one of the reasons it was, it was appealing to me doing religious studies is because you could see that unlike other fictional worlds, there isn't one straightforward you know, explanation of any of these theological or metaphysical themes. So there's not one answer. Each of the cultures in the game disagree and have their own versions of the myths um, mm -hmm. that, like in real life, sort of interrelate because they come from the same, you know, reality, but don't fully agree. And some of those differences cause a lot of conflict in the game. So there's one text that I've brought up a few times when we were talking about this, which is called the mono myth, um, mm -hmm. which I think first appears in Morrowind, but has appeared in the other games. And it's written as a book about kind of the metaphysics of, of uh, the world um, and kind of goes into the different versions of the creation myth from different cultures. So mm -hmm. just to summarize it really quickly without kind of just reading it is that, um, you know, it, it really harps in on the fact that the, the schism between the humans and the Ald Mary, which are the high elves, is this idea about, you know, whether the creation of, of the material world was... Um, evil or good basically i mean mm -hmm. that's kind of where it, where it goes and so there's there's you know there's this uh thing that i think I'm, so I'm, you know this is where i'm gonna say the wrong cultural thing <laughs> but but uh so the the okay so all the tamrielic religions begin the same there's the dualism of anu and his other so um different cultures have different names for those forces anu padome i think that's more of the human naming um anu anuiel sithis Akel, Satek, Akel, is, is not. So the is, is not is kind of um, telling there. So, you know, Anu is kind of this static light. And then Sithis or Padome is this uh, corrupting, inexpressible action or maybe darkness. Mm -hmm. um, and then their reaction and this kind of a yin yang sort of thing results in the gray maybe, um, which that interplay uh, kind of creates the possibility of, you know, existence because otherwise there would just be pure static light or otherwise it would just be chaos but then their mixing or interaction creates the universe essentially mm -hmm. so it starts from that point and above that there's you know uh, you know be before that there's this um more of a like pleroma that's just completely full and, and static so i yeah, think yeah. that's that that's the original kind of and then all the way that plays out where the gods becoming born from that and all that kind of is is the disagreements between the different in-game cultures 
Totally. Yeah. And there's a, there's a figure. So like uh, alongside this sort of um, uh, static light and like constant change chaos, um, there's also this figure Lorcan who then is sort of essentially um, I mean, all the, the texts say it in different ways, but it's yeah. either tricks or convinces or decides to like, let the, let that yin yang thing actually manifest into like the world. Right. Um, um, and, uh, and then like the, the human races tend to see that as a good thing because they can, it gives the, it gives the, the, the mortal world a chance to connect to the divinity and whereas the um, uh, the elves see it as a as a fall that everything mm-hmm. like everything is crappy because of that, <laughs> um, right? Which yeah. this sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, yeah, like the uh, um, it, a lot of people will like can and have, and maybe I'll do a, a quick shout out here. Maybe we'll come back to it at different points. But somebody on the the Reddit uh, or no, sorry, the Discord, um, uh, I think Gnostic Hub under our Talknosis uh, channel actually did a really big um, uh, uh, like outline and description of mapping, mapping things onto Gnosticism. I think it's really interesting. Um, and, and I think it, it lends itself to it. Like I think, um, and uh, so, yeah. So like the reason I guess we're kind of talking about these texts and why I think it's interesting to connect it to Gnosticism is that um, uh I was, so I think for one thing, I think it's interesting that the texts themselves are unstable, that, uh, that no person's, um, conclusion is true. Like even the designers have, have sort of have done their best to not clearly define the one way this was true. And mm-hmm. none of the games have done that either. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, which I think, like, what I think is interesting about that is that it means that the, 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 the world that you're playing in isn't seen as solely a thing to like, it's not seen say solely as a Gnostic dualism world that traps us. It's also not seen solely as a path to ascension. It's kind of a, um, and, and how you feel about that, how you process that is like, that's the interesting tension, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think so you know, there's this other text, Spirit of Nern, and it sort of s- says a little bit about that where, um, you know, Nern being the name for the material world um, mm-hmm. or the, the mortal plane. And it says, uh, uh, you know, all souls know deep down they came originally from somewhere else that Nern is a cruel and crucial step to what comes next. What is this next? Uh, some wish to return to the original state, the spirit realm, and that Lorcan is the demon that hinders their way. To them, Nern is a prison, an illusion of escape. Others think that Lorcan created the world as the testing ground for transcendence. To them, the spirit realm was already a prison. That true escape is now finally possible. So then that also, you know, we've seen this a few places when we were kind of preparing for the show, and it was kind of my own feeling about this as well, which is that um, there's kind of a debate within the game world, kind of like debate about Gnostic theology in the real world, about whether the Demiurge is this evil figure who is trapping people in this material plane, or... Uh, in some way kind of is the agent of e- there even being able to be this kind of uh, the, d- the dynamism of existence to begin with that allows you to reach this kind of ascension or transcendence in some way. So that's all kind of built in as well. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's a, uh, I think like what, uh, what I think is interesting is for those two, for those two perspectives to be competing within the same overarching game yeah. experience or narrative um, uh, rather than it being um, two different faith approaches that we tend to see as sort of mutually exclusive. Like one is true and the right. other isn't or not, yeah. you know, yeah. mm-hmm. um, whereas like as a, as a player and like sort of explorer of the lore, you are, uh, you are sort of asked to consider both if you're, yeah. if you're digging in um, which like, I think um, this is also kind of going down a bit of a, a, uh, uh, rabbit hole, but I'll I'll try to pr- pull it back. Like one of the things I've found most interesting lately is is looking at how the perception of universal truth uh, has like often been a an interesting sticking point for a lot of monotheistic faiths, and like 
honestly, like this is okay. Hot take time here. This is what this is the thing that I think. Mm-hmm. I think both classic, a lot of classic Gnostics and modern Gnostic, classic Gnostics were doing this. I think modern Gnostics should do this, which is to say, not be trying to find a single universal truth, especially yeah. a new one that maps on maps on top of old ones you used to live, believe. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, rather than looking for like a totalizing theory, you should be lit. Like I think. You follow the Elder Scrolls example and mm. always be able to see both as possible. Yeah, yeah. You know? I have a, so on an in-game uh, way of talking about this, I don't know if at the end of Daggerfall, I know that you have to make a certain choice of who you're going to, I think it's the Numidium, there's this device that you have to give to somebody in the plot. Um, mm-hmm. And in, so that completely changes the ending of the game, um, like which faction you're going to do that with. Mm-hmm. Um, and then rather than... So kind of speaking to what you're saying about, um, you know, it not being one overarching narrative that's just kind of universalizing. In the future games, they actually handled that by calling it a thing called a dragon break, which meant that reality was actually kind of damaged by this event and that all the the different possibilities happened at the same time. So they actually built that into the plot in kind of this meta textual way that your player choice wasn't just, a lot of games will in the sequel or something will say, well, here's the default Thing that happened and we're right. gonna go yeah. with that. But in this it was like, no, all of that happened at the same time. Metaphysically, what does that mean? And then they just played that out, which is really to me, that's a really fascinating way to kind of deal with the the kind of unique narrative possibility of a video game. So yeah, well, and okay, um the the uh, dealing with the unique narrative possibility yeah. of the video game, that leads me to um going off into a different direction a bit. Um uh is I think th- uh the other interesting thing about how they've they've built this to 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 sort of live inside a tension between between um, different different approaches is that um, uh, that they they've also just very practically designed it so that they're not never trapping themselves in future games. Yeah. Um, uh, and that like the, the the names being slippery, like the fact that that like Lorcan has many names, mm-hmm. you know, like. Um, uh one of the one of the names of the i think like that maybe that that primordial light is akatosh or maybe i'm getting that wrong the the like the time dragon um, yeah the time dragon akatosh yeah yes but i don't know if that's the like the 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 utter light you know the yeah, he's the perfect. second <laughs> like a not this is the other thing like like the secret book of john or something like each there's like multiple levels exactly so I think akatosh is the second level i think you're right yeah i think you're right um and like Akatosh is sort of this idea of the is like the 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 arbiter of time or like the whatever the it's also like the first dragon maybe um, yeah. but uh, but is more of a more of a deity and more of a concept um, but also uh, it going back to Daggerfall like it it says that the that the end of Daggerfall was this like dragon break yeah. which means that time split into like yeah. seven directions <laughs> based right. on your choice yeah. um, and. And that the designers don't have to like they've they've built in all of these hooks and 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 nooks and crannies, so that like a designer could probably come up with things that seemed vaguely Elder Scrollsy, without even having read all of this stuff. Yeah. And uh-huh. then, uh, as long as it generally maps, people can start to go, oh, that might be Lorcan, that might be Vivek, mm-hmm. that might be so and so. Um, I think that's that's fascinating. And like again, I think, like we've uh, uh, we've said before on the show um, that like looking at the at the Nag Hammadi texts as uh like um competing fan fictions of of uh you know like a various sort of christian and pre-christian and post-christian faiths um of uh like of around around gnostic ideas uh, like trying to try out the metaphors try out the the frameworks and so i think like what i th- what i find really interesting here is that there's um uh that that's happening within a game <laughs> yeah. um, that I think um, isn't explicitly trying to to offer a metaphysical solution for anything, mm-hmm. but nonetheless is seemingly doing it. Sorry, that kind of that yeah. went on a whole random. No, I think it's true. Path. I think I think it does lead to. Uh, so for me, I know we've talked a little bit about this, uh, you know, before we did the show, but I think it does lead to thinking about the contributions of of Michael Kirkbride a little bit mm-hmm. um, because. Um, and I know it's, kind of, I feel like that's, it's not controversial because I think anybody who's really into this 
is really loves his work because I think it's it's such a source of uh, why there's such like a theological complexity in the Elder Scrolls lore. Mm -hmm. um, but it does kind of introduce this concept of, you know, is there like a single authorial kind of intention behind this? Is it leading to some kind of interpretation of theology or, or metaphysics? Or um, is it kind of up for grabs a little bit? So, you know, I think that's been a debate a little bit in the community even because there are many texts that Michael Kirkbride, who's one of the game, uh, one of the past uh, designers and kind of people responsible for writing a lot of the lore, especially in Morrowind, mm -hmm. has provided a lot of texts even outside of the game. So, and that has led to a fan community um, of people writing their own sort of lore texts outside of the game. So, mm -hmm. which then, you know, it becomes its own world, essentially, even when you're not playing. So, yeah. Exactly. Um, and I think actually that's a, that's an interesting point too. Like, um, so uh, Michael Kirkbride is, uh, and Michael, if you're hearing this, we'd love to have you on the show. But so like, yeah, I think, as you say, it's not controversial to say that he contributed a lot to, to this, I think this specific flavor of, of uh, the Elder Scrolls that we're talking about. And I think it has persisted past him, but he's, yeah. he's definitely added a lot to it. And um, uh, what I find fascinating about his approach. So, the in-game texts are often playful. Um, they they go in a lot of different directions. They're often not trying, like they're often trying to, um, how do I put this? They're uh, unreliable. Um, they, they tend to not try to be definitive. Um, but then even Kirkbride, when speaking, like, and people know that it's him writing, it's like it's his name on, on Reddit or what have you, um, uh, will then, will answer both in universe like he'll say you know th yeah. this text was lost because the so-and-so you know um burned their archives um but and then he'll also say like um you know this was something we came up with you know when when uh, uh we were trying to answer a particular game problem so he'll even there's an instability even mm -hmm. in his response um yeah but between the, the the meta game world of it like the building of the game and then the in universe which seems like he's like it's very it's still a very living place for him because the other point point about this is that um despite all this playfulness it never seems frivolous if that makes sense it never seems just whimsical right um yeah there there is actually like i think a um a real commitment <laughs> um, yeah to the to the game world to the flavor to the tone which i think also i think is a big part of what we respond to here that it isn't yeah. it's not um this isn't like following finding somebody's D, &D notes of a, <laughs> an extensively built world that just is like incredibly detailed it's got it's got heft to it you know mm -hmm. like it's got um and and he's he uh, I think again I'm not really uh, saying anything controversial. He is he has called himself a Gnostic heretic, and that he's uh, he did uh, I think religious studies in in post secondary, and so um, yeah, I think he's also referenced uh, Borges. So it's not um, mm -hmm. uh, it is like you're seeing somebody who is committing to having these flavors in the world and not um, uh, uh, like it, it's more than a surface level distraction, you know. Yeah, and I think, and I think one of the things about that that's interesting is, is as you say, because he writes from an in-character perspective. So you know, there's some text uh, kind of was led through some of the, the Discord comments to this the love letter from the Fifth Era that he posted, I guess, in around 2005 on the, uh, the official forums. And mm. so again, this is providing like a really interesting kind of interpretation of of the the Lorcan myth and all that sort of stuff. And but because it's written from an in-game perspective, you could say this is wrong too, you know? So yeah. he doesn't, it's it's like a debate. He's using these masks of, of characters to do this kind of theological debate, which is a little different, I would say, than, um, you know, a different type of fantasy world like Tolkien or something, which feels very strong in the authorial intent of what the meaning of the metaphysics are, even mm -hmm. though there are a lot of interesting metaphysics, but you know that there's ultimately a kind of a right answer to some extent, and there's one person providing it. Yeah, but this doesn't feel that way. It's a very different way of kind of using fantasy to debate these concepts. That, I think that's a that's a really great point too. And also, like, so there's a um, there, there's a meme I think that uh, that occasionally pops around the internet of of Tolkien uh, talking about 
fantasy as an escape, but like almost in a Gnostic sense of escape. Like he says that, you know, it's a, it's escaping a world that is often feels insufficient to us and, Mm -hmm. and often feels like it traps us. And, and um, so that like, why wouldn't you want to escape? It turns out actually that this quote, it goes around as though it's from Tolkien, but it it turns out it's actually from Ursula K. Le Guin. And I'll, (laughs) I'll see if I can remember to to post a link to that in the, in the, um, in the show notes, but um, just make a note here. Um, But uh, there is something interesting, I think, as you say about it, not, Kirkbride offering this flavor, but encouraging it to be a community conversation um, with the player, the other, uh, the fans, the other designers, the NPCs in the game, that it's a, it's this sort of rolling conversation, which I think makes it a really unique experience. Um, I think it does change your, your, when you, when you delve into this stuff, it actually does change your experience of playing the game for me, at least because, um, you know, uh, whether or not all this is intentional if you know some of these things, there's this kind of overlay of the world uh, that's much more uh, like dense and metaphysical than what you might see in the game. Mm-hmm. So for me, you know, wandering around in like Skyrim or something, you see these, or or Oblivion, you see like the tower in the capital city in Oblivion. Mm-hmm. And and if you're just playing it in kind of a basic way, that's, you know, it's a tower, whatever, it's like pixelated. But, you know, this is early <laughs> Xbox or whatever. But if you play it and you've read all the stuff, you know that this is like a metaphysical, uh, uh, you know, kind of access Mundi at the same time as being just a building in the game. Mm-hmm. There's all this lore around the tower and how it relates to the creation of, of the, the game world and all the stuff that just... It, it, and so for me, that was always a really uh, big source of like joy playing these games was that you could play it on the basic level and then there was this level of like I'm exploring this really kind of intense theological landscape um mm-hmm. but i'm sure that's not I'm, I'm sure that's not the mainstream usage of it but for me it was like an important part of playing it well and and so i might i might suggest that an experience you're having as that uh yeah. um in that moment of sort of uh experiencing this this story beneath the story or this yeah. greater level of lore is you're experiencing what the game might call chim mm. <laughs> which is oh, uh, yeah. uh an interesting concept um in the games it's usually connected to a a major use of like otherworldly power um uh and it, one of its definitions is a state of being which allows for escape from all known laws and limitations um that sounds a lot like maybe gnosis. <laughs> yeah. um, now it, like so many things, it is never that simple, and it's not as simple as uh, um, it just mapping one to one onto what one on how one would define gnosis. But I again, I do think it's interesting that like deep within the 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 bones of this setting is a um, is a concept around sort of an empowering knowledge or an, an empowering state of mind. Um, now the and it like it's not even as simple as that as this give uh, this empowering state of mind meaning that you can cast fireball it's more like <laughs> that it, in this metatextual sense like chim is maybe what allows you to save your game you know <laughs> um or modify the game or like do do things like that um mm-hmm. yeah i mean i think so if we get into this it gets into the weeds a little bit especially <laughs> including to some of the comments that we've gotten which is but i do think you know yeah, I think it's interesting that you mentioned that maybe that experience of playing the game is, is, is almost as if you've achieved this to some mm-hmm. degree because, um, and, you know, playing the game in a different way than kind of just playing the, you know, the the basic storylines and plots and things like that because, um, you know, they're, they're, the debate over whether Chim is Gnosis is really interesting and really cuts to the arguments about Lorcan that are in the game <laughs> about, you know, theologically speaking, with the creation of the material world, this... Uh, the, the in, a, like a path to follow towards transcendence or is it a prison um you know is i've seen some of the interpretations suggesting that successfully kind of achieving gnosis in this game world would mean you become kind of the godhead of your own world which is an interesting interpretation that um you know then then kind of maps maybe not onto all traditional gnosticism but it, it would sort of suggest you become kind of a demiurge yourself um, which has a kind of left-hand path sort of esoteric flavor to it. Mm. Um, so there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff there that I think we could like get into a theological debate about it. Um, like was Lorcan right? 
that would be an interesting conversation. <laughs> it was Lorcan right? That's yeah, great. But yeah, um, I don't know. Well, and I think like if um, if like so many of you listening to us right now, if you feel like you'd like to experience Chim um, <laughs> or Gnosis, then uh, a really easy way to do that is to contribute to our Patreon. Oh, yeah. um, at any level, uh, we guarantee um, a full experience of Gnosis and um, and Chim pretty much at the same time. It's really unique, actually. I think this is the only place where you can get that. Um, uh, patreon.com slash Gnostic. Uh, if you want to set up a subscription or uh, paypal.me slash Gnostic, if you'd like to, uh, to just give us a single burst of chim, that's another way to do it. Um, but uh, yeah, so seriously, if you're enjoying the show, if you're enjoying hearing us kind of riff on these sort of things um, and you want us to do more of it, let us know um, and, uh, and uh, see if you can contribute because it, it helps us do more of this stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, we've gone into a few different directions. What's uh, we we kind of got into the Chim mm -hmm. and that debate about whether Lorcan was right. I think um, I want to I I kind of want to hold that back for some of us for talking a bit about how this can be of use to Gnostics today. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but I I think like the other thing I want to touch on here are the scrolls, these Elder Scrolls, yeah. um, that uh, that are both a text and meta text. Um, that they have this power to modify the world. I think that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, uh, this, like, you know, it, sort of very much the in the beginning was the word kind of mm -hmm. kind of vibe to it. Um, yeah. So, did you have any kind of any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I think yeah, it's interesting. So, it, it, Elder Scrolls, as the name of the series, has always been kind of interesting to me because. You know, because Skyrim has been out for such a long time now, I feel like I, whenever I've talked about these games, I say Skyrim, and people know what that is more than they mm -hmm. remember Elder Scrolls, because the Elder Scrolls are sort of an enigmatic sort of presence in the games, right? So mm -hmm. they are always sort of have some purpose or use in the story, but but the fact that that's the name of the series is kind of fascinating in itself. Um, totally. It, it does sort of suggest that um, that this, this kind of, uh, you know, analysis of, of what what writing and and the word has to do with creation is part of built into what the point of these games are um, exactly so I, I think that that that's made me i don't know if i could explain what the elder scrolls are that easily though <laughs> so i, know, I, I mean think, you know i don't think anyone can <laughs> i know that um, if you read them you go blind progressively um so the monks in the game are blind so i don't know if we can't really talk about it <laughs> yeah because maybe you'll go deaf if yeah. we if we say too much um no i think that is that is interesting and yeah like i was even going to mention that the fact that these the these monks go uh, go blind and i think like um there is something around uh for me like and this actually even goes back to what i was saying about not looking for like a um a totalizing truth or a fundamental truth mm -hmm. um uh but seeing seeing things that approach truth as useful i don't know if that makes sense but like um if uh, like so within the game the idea like and i think at, at first the scrolls kind of just started out as like like a um uh like the equivalent of the star wars opening crawl like these right. were written on the elder scrolls and then i think as time moved on and probably through kirkbride and a lot of the other designers they became um uh artifacts in the game and then had more like weren't just documents they became yeah. these 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 do these like um uh these things that archive both past and future events and and the the content on them is not fixed um uh they are like yeah so they 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 live in kind of a, a paradox you could maybe write like a thunder perfect mind of the elder scrolls yeah. <laughs> i am wow. this and this like i am this and that you know um heck that'd be kind of interesting um but uh where was i going with this oh um is that yeah like we we do tend i think like people just in general we use language um as a way to approach ideas but then at times we can start to be see the language as the idea not mm -hmm. the thing pointing to the idea yeah and that's that's again something i mean again the the whole series we've been talking about has been d dealing with this tension between between definitions but i think the scrolls themselves are this really potent symbol of that like that they um that that they can't be 
uh, read without without some kind of risk, but that but that risk also has like a I don't know like a um, a really compelling mystery to it. Yeah, I think I think in my understanding as well, they're not even text yet at at first. I mean, they're 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 the possibility of text, or but they're mm -hmm. also text. So it, it, until an event in them happens, the text isn't in set in stone in some way. And then once you have read it and something from the Elder Scrolls has come to pass, then it becomes in like, it becomes set into the text. It, so I'm I might be totally wrong, about this, but this is my understanding of some of it, which means totally. that they're both something you can read, but also a possibility of something you could read at the same time. Which is like, yeah, which is odd. and which is a little bit like apocrypha in general, which is you know, many angle. I mean, if people are familiar with Gnosticism outside of, of the game world, you know, there are so many angles and texts on all these topics that you can't, I mean, all, all, there are a lot of possibilities to read um, in Gnosticism, but, you know, they, they kind of remain both kind of uh, their potential ideas about the world at the same mm -hmm. time as, as things you can read. So I don't know, it reminds me of that a little bit. Totally. It, it actually also even like at a, at a weird level reminds me of um uh like uh quantum indeterminacy where like right. yeah uh you sometimes don't know what's happening when you're measuring um uh, quantum phenomena like you can measure its speed or its what is it a vibration or something mm -hmm. but you can't measure both um and and it's unknown like it's like something like um observing it affects the the outcome right um it's yeah i'm i am not going to try to synopsize quantum yeah. physics right now but it but that that concept of like um it doesn't exist until it happens or it's it, it's more in a potentiality and then a and then a locality so it, I, a lot of this that we've talked about with chim and the elder scrolls now just feels like we're describing playing in the games which i'm guessing is probably the point <laughs> but <laughs> but it's interesting because you know you're in as people know maybe we haven't talked about this enough but in these games, you know, it's not a set path through a storyline. It's you mm -hmm. have a lot of choices you make that affect the game world. So in some sense, are you just reading the Elder Scrolls while you're playing? Is that the idea? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. is like and that this this sort of indeterminacy in the text is because no one's everyone has their own personal Elder Scrolls because yeah. it'll be, you know, you're 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 writing your own Elder Scroll as you as you play the game. Um uh yeah, I think that's that's a that's a really valid choice there too. And again, like the uh, that capacity of freedom, that capacity of standing outside of the opening dungeon and then deciding which way to go, applies to the, even these concepts. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the 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 other thing that I guess I wanted to touch on here too, we've already kind of talked about the the debate within the world. Um, uh, and watching people debate things in there. I think uh, there, a quick note I want to make that is that I think about that is that I think it's interesting that a lot of these lore debates tend to avoid just pointing at a metatextual level, like seeing it as explanations of, of game mechanics um, and, and also avoid trying to reach an orthodoxy. Um, mm -hmm. Everything seems to be about... Um, about the debate like it almost feels to me like a like a um how do i put it like like an english department um debating texts with each other where yeah. it's only like it's only as good as your argument there's no there's no higher authority that says which ones are right you have to just defend your your i think it's it's like a rabbinic debate almost you know, right. like, like a midrash, which is these are interpretations of these texts, which are the games, and yeah, and then nobody's necessarily right about it. They're just layers of kind of debate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, textual criticism as as a spiritual yeah. practice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so now here's the other thing, though, too, is that so like we we've talked, I think, a lot about how exciting a lot of this stuff mm -hmm. is. We've also touched on how you don't have to experience it, like that a lot of people will play these games and really only brush against some of these concepts um, and, and still get a fully entertaining game experience. Like they will, they, they won't determine this quantum indeterminacy of, <laughs> of theological concepts. They'll, they'll fight demons and they'll kill monsters and they'll, you know, get, get powerful and they'll finish the game. Um, mm -hmm. uh, is there something there about the fact that this, 
lore is sort of just below the surface or that it needs to be sought for uh, that that makes it kind of like is again sort of a, a gnostic or esoteric layer to this yeah I mean I think that 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 what you described basically is is kind of the experience of having an esoteric interpretation of the world so and that kind of debate and, and that process as as a spiritual practice so I think you know, I, I'm thinking about in some of the comments we got for the show where people were saying they were very interested in Elder Scrolls lore before they became Gnostic. I bet mm. that's not a, I bet that's a repeated, I bet we could find a lot of people that with that theme. I mean, it's almost even true in my own life where I was interested in this before. I, I wasn't really interested in religion when I first played Oblivion, you know, that came later. Mm -hmm. I and mean, I wonder how much the experience of, you know, interpreting the game world this way prepares you to be kind of esoteric in your interpretation of the real world too. Um, mm. So, you know, it, it maybe it's, it's, it's a grooming, it's Gnostic grooming. <laughs> Although uh, grooming has a, is a, oh, yeah. well. <laughs> a dangerous term now. <laughs> um, it's been, it's been weaponized. Um, I mean, we could do a whole show on how uh, language has been weaponized and as a, some sort of anti-Gnostic things, but I, I'll, we'll save that for another show. <laughs> um uh, but, uh, but yeah, well, and I, I wonder, like, it is sort of an interesting question. Like, would someone have discovered Gnosticism or did some, did some people discover Gnosticism through Elder Scrolls? Did some, you know, like, is it a sort of a Venn diagram of interest? Like right. people will tend to. It's just uh, your tendency that you, you know, you'd be interested in this side of the game and then you're interested in Gnosticism, uh, you know, later in life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or like, does somebody, you know, get deep into the lore and then somebody else, like maybe they see that Kirkbride calls himself a Gnostic heretic and then starts yeah. Googling Gnosticism, you know? Yeah, I don't know. Or, or sees this show or sees a Reddit thread of like, or uh, the pay on, on um, what is it, Discord, uh, one of the one of the members made a really big outline of like connecting all of the dots. And like, if, if you discovered, like, let's say you watch this show, then you go look at that Discord thing, then maybe you have a whole reading list of Gnostic texts that you're going to engage mm -hmm. with. Yeah. Um, I think what's fascinating to me is that, um, for, like, these are, not, these are not small games. And as a game studio, uh, Bethesda, who makes these games, has only gotten bigger and bigger. Like, they're, they're one right. of the bigger game makers that, that exist now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for, like... A lot of other games that I've played, a lot of other fantasy settings that I've played, don't try to hide their world building, <laughs> right. if that makes sense. Uh -huh. um, and I think it is, to me, I don't, I don't have a specific point here. I just think it's absolutely fascinating that this really engaging and interesting lore is not... Um, is not is not often placed at the forefront of the game experience or of its mm -hmm. marketing, you know, or anything like that. Um, uh, it's not hidden, but it's not it's not the the core point, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, and I wonder if that's a you know a choice because of marketing. Like we don't think people more mainstream players would engage with this, or is it? I'm sure it's a little bit of that, or is it? As we're we've been saying, it's kind of part of the esoteric practice to have to delve into it a little further yeah so. you know at like <laughs> probably both <laughs> yeah yeah um that uh and i think I, I also wonder too like daggerfall or sorry morrowind um uh was like a hallmark of the series in terms of really like exemplifying a lot of these concepts but it also was the strangest out of all of the, the in terms yeah, of its setting yeah, yeah. um uh so I, I also wonder too if there's a sense that like it kickstarts a lot of these these tones and then things sort of like calm down a little you know if that makes sense they get a little less weird yeah yeah but but they're part of a of a um, of a franchise of a brand and like rather than start rather than do another Elder Scrolls game but have to call it something else and change all this stuff that's like well we're just going to keep the setting like we're you know we're not um, and so it sort of sneaks in if that makes sense. Yeah, I wonder about that because I, I do know that it's probably a controversy f among fans of the game. I'm sure many, many people became interested in this level of the game through Morrowind because mm -hmm. that's the one that has the biggest mark from Michael Kirkbride. It's the one that has the most exotic kind of game world where mm -hmm. some of these theological concepts are actually built into the plot in a way that's probably not the, the case in, as much in the other games. Mm -hmm. um, 
I do know one of the issues that happened was that, you know, if you go from Morrowind to Oblivion, some of this gets pushed a little bit into the background more. Mm -hmm. um, so like sort of the Roman parallels kind of f fall away a little bit. Oblivion looks much more like a 14th century medieval sort of thing, high medieval game world, uh, mm -hmm. some of that sort of stuff. But I do think because this was so popular on some level, you couldn't really, and it was such like in, built into the bones of the metaphysics, it kind of comes back out. And I wonder, I know that there's Elder Scrolls online. I wonder how much of this kind of plays out, uh, it could, which is a massively multiplayer online game. I wonder mm -hmm. how much of this comes out in that game, if, whether people playing it regularly are really into this or whether it's a different fan base entirely. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that is interesting to me is, um, and I haven't played it yet, so people shouldn't spoil it, but um, <laughs> Bethesda just came out with Starfield, which is a sci-fi some people have said it's kind of like a Skyrim in space sort of game, mm -hmm. um, which I know does engage with some of these kind of meta textual um, sort of themes as well. Oh, um, just from a sci-fi perspective, that's a little more like interstellar or something like that. Okay. Um, so I actually have it, but I've only played five minutes of it. I haven't had the time, <laughs> but it'd be interesting. Maybe we should do another show one day because, uh, you know, it seems like the, some of these themes are carried out there as well. So this might just be part of Bethesda's kind of DNA that they engage with this sort of stuff. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say if anyone wants to become um, a, a Patreon sponsor or a PayPal sponsor of uh, uh, Jason and Nick getting uh, better <laughs> machines to be able to play Starfield, yeah, um, it's a big ticket price, but we promise the show will be <laughs> worth it. <laughs> I mean, that actually does lead to one other comment I had about some of this, which is another thing that Bethesda does do really well is uh, really you know, encourage and emphasize modding. I don't know how mm. familiar you are with the modding community for these games, but that's a whole other level where it's not even just the lore, but people actually being given the tools by the company to build their own storylines and characters and, you know, modules. Yeah. And in some ways that matches what we're saying, right? It's that you become a kind of a demiurge yourself. You're creating your own world. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's a big part of the appeal for these games. So Skyrim yeah. really came out in 2013, I think. And yet, has still had a vibrant community just for modders. Like a few years ago, I played it just to play a lot of mods on it. And totally, I, I installed a lot of mods and then played it a little bit, but it was more installing the mods that was interesting to me. Yeah, you know, uh, there's even people who've made whole whole games of, of a similar level of scope yeah. um, that they release for free that are entirely like... Um, conversions from based on mods yeah. from uh, from these games like you have to own the original game but then you can play this whole other game that fans have made all on their own mm -hmm. and i think um two things on that like um one of the things that kirkbride created was this uh um, among many things was um a text called the 30 or a uh, many texts <laughs> sorry i keep editing myself here the 36 lessons of vivek uh vivek is an npc in morrowind kind of a um uh, both a trickster figure, perhaps a demiurgic figure, or a, or a logos Jesus figure, depending on your 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 interest. Um, uh, and the lessons are kind of sermons, kind of like re uh, religious poems, but they also refer to meta textual, meta gaming elements, including this idea of of the the Elder Scrolls construction construction set, the tools to mod the game, which they they released when they released the game. Like as you say the um from the from the day one when this game came out people could make their own stuff yeah um what i think is interesting here is that with in this idea of world making um and maybe this is a kind of a good way to segue into how this can be of use to gnostics today is that um it's not th that demiurgic quality isn't inherently bad yeah um uh and so, yeah, I think that's, that's interesting to me. And I think maybe that's kind of when I come into this, when I think like, how is this, can, can this be of any use to Gnostics today? Um, to me, it is about um, kind of liberating your perception of Gnosticism from, from just another dualism, yeah. um, if that makes sense. Uh, I, I, one thing I've often complained about is seeing interpretations of Gnosticism where they, it, they just map a new good and bad on top of the old good and bad. Right. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a seductive method because it tends to explain a little more. Like it's, you know, if Christianity has mysteries such as like, why do bad things happen? <laughs> you know, and like, and things like that, that were like, well, we don't really fully know the mind of God, etc. Like Gnostic, 
versions of Gnosticism are like, oh no, we've got an answer. It's all laid out. You know, mm -hmm. here it is. I um I I think those are actually those aren't even the Gnostic texts. And as I see them, those are reductive interpretations of those texts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um uh and I think the to me, a, a big part and I've I've been saying it the whole time, but the value I'm getting out of what uh what the Elder Scrolls are doing is that it is they're encouraging um encouraging you to play with those texts, not to take any of them as a single truth. Yeah, and I think I mean for me part of it is that well, I guess just to give my own perspective, uh it's really appealing to me because I actually like the idea of the sympathetic interpretation of Lorcan is kind of my own theological perspective. Yeah. So from, from that, <laughs> and I think it goes even to some of our conversations we've had in the past on the show about Thelema and other things, which is that this concept that, you know, static being would not be a positive thing. Mm -hmm. So the fact that there's some, some sort of form of change and this possibility of experience, the potentiality of experience being introduced into the world is a positive thing. Um, so that's kind of a core tenant that I have. So it's really interesting to see a game where that, that's one of the core concepts that's being debated about you know and then yeah you know the humans and the elves are fighting over you know whether this is the right interpretation that there's no one answer being given like i don't need one answer to be given in the in the game it's just that just that to be one of the themes um is is really theologically appealing um so i think like as you say um one of the skills you can build by really engaging with this is you know being able to um, maybe not see it just as that, that kind of, sometimes when people get into Gnosticism, they're like the Demiurge is the secret evil that is controlling like world events or something, but actually that there's this much more complex, you know, potential sympathetic interpretation of why, even though creation is a fall in some way, it's this necessary fall for, um, you to be on this path of experience. Uh, so I think that's really beautiful about it. Totally. Yeah. There's like one thing that I've, I tend to revolve around on this is um, that like we are, we are like, um, we are on this earth, you know, we are experiencing things and, and my experience, like I, I would never say that there isn't terrible things happening in the world, but my experience of the world is not uniformly terrible. Yeah. And I think um, for, I think for very few people, it is, like 100% terrible all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and to to try to just take anything that is terrible that's happening as the plan of somebody else out there who's trying to keep you down is, for one thing, it, it takes it out of your own hands to do anything about it, you yeah. know? I can't, I can't deal with it. It's the Demiurge's fault, you know? Yeah. Um, it also can mean that like maybe your way of trying to get out of the Demiurge is, go, is this fully internalized, fully sort of world negating world ignoring mm -hmm. um i'm not gonna i'm not gonna recycle i you know i'm not gonna put my compost out because like you know this is all part of the demiurge why should i why should i contribute to that i'm just gonna right. you know read my books and meditate and mm -hmm. and and argue online about uh about the interpretations <laughs> of narcissism um hey i argue about i argue online about it too <laughs> yeah. but um but it's that world negating part that i think i'm i'm uh uh, critical of um and i think like uh to me like one of the things i've i'm kind of bouncing around here, i'll try to i'll try to bring it back to elder scrolls is that like um one of the things i've been finding really attractive about uh classical stoic philosophy is that it tends to not get caught up in the question of why we're here it just sort of starts with well we're here yeah. you know yeah. so we might as well be virtuous and like you know, live as, as peaceful a life as we can while trying to like contribute to the, to the common good. Um, like I find that's a really attractive method and, and, and when it does touch on cosmology, it's not, it's often not trying to, con trying to say the reason we're away, we're not connected to that is because of something we did or something that happened to us or at us. Like we're not, it's not taking it personally, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. all of this to say, uh, sorry, I'll I'll bring it yeah. back to, to Elder Scrolls here. Is um, uh, that but like when you're playing an Elder Scrolls game, you you chose to play it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and right. You chose to get into the lore, uh, and so so there is that sense of like it almost encourages you to not have a 
strictly world negating approach because mm -hmm. otherwise you wouldn't you wouldn't play the game you know <laughs> right oh that's yeah no that's really interesting actually i mean i think and then and yet in the game if you you know i've read about people whose entire experience of skyrim is they're like a hunter in the woods and all they do mm -hmm. is hunt deer and like like really advance their skill set to like make you know clothes out of deer pelts you know what i mean and so it's interesting that you can pretty much do whatever you want but as you said kind of earlier there is this urging to engage with the world and to you know i mean it's usually a world saving kind of plot that's mm -hmm. kind of always there in the background so you can kind of deny that if you want but at some level there is this sense that you know you're supposed to engage with what's actually going on around you so i do think that the dialectic of that is is also an interesting kind of if you want to apply it to this level of what are we supposed to be like in the world you know mm -hmm. so it's it's not it, it is true that you can do anything and you don't ever have to play the main storyline but there is one so I think that that's that's sort of an interesting piece of the design as well. Yeah, yeah, it is it is there to kind of be discovered. Um, uh, there there is a, um, maybe a, a few thoughts. I'm as to kind of start to wrap it up would be, yeah. I think there's a um, uh, a um, a note that I think I've heard people say like so. Uh, we've got a Facebook group for this show uh, that we that we sort of teasingly call the Gnostic elite um, uh, because there's this idea that those who achieve Gnosis or who are aware of Gnosticism are, you know, um, we're the elite because we know more about the truth. And this is actually like our teasing usage of the term is, is trying to highlight the the problems, like the problematic elements of this, this sort of elitism. But um, one of the things that... Uh, um, that I've heard a lot uh, among a lot of really good thinkers on this is that Gnosticism and is, is an elite to whom anybody can be a member. Um, and that, that uh, um, I think it was Houston Smith actually had a really great lecture on Gnosticism where he was saying that like there's sort of big G Gnosticism, which is like classical Gnosticism, historical texts, a defined period, a general corpus that we can point to. And then there's, that's capital G Gnosticism and there's small G Gnosticism, which is, uh, which is more like an approach, which is kind of what we're doing here. Um, mm -hmm. Thinking about things within a, a general Gnostic vibe. Um, and, uh, um, oh shoot, I think I lost my own train of thought there. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was I saying about playing the game? Um, oh shoot. <laughs> well, I would, can I say something? I yeah, 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 about. jump in. <clears throat> yeah, I think like, I, as we were having this conversation, I wondered if anyone would be a little frustrated because... Um, we weren't, you know, even in terms of discussing the game lore, we weren't doing the thing where we were saying, well, I think this is one interpretation in the game and this is another and, and having like a really dense theological debate about what's right. In mm -hmm. that sense, we were talking about this other level of like, what does it mean that this is set up to be able to do that? Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that relates to this idea of, of big G and Austin or small G where it's like the, which I, probably everybody listening to the show has experienced where some people online will be well. I read this text and this proves that the demiurge is XYZ and the archons are this. And then someone says, uh, you know, no, I don't agree with that. And then, so it's very much, you know, all of these things in the Gnostic texts are true literally. And there's one right answer, um, which you could do in the game, you know, in the elder scrolls lore as well. You could be like, well, we're debating all of this, but we're, you know, eventually there's going to be the, the one right answer if we just argue about it enough or, you could say, well, what does it mean to have this these themes or the possibility of this debate in the first place? I think we've been doing totally. that more, which yeah, yeah isn't well, might, some people might not like. You know, yeah, I mean? no, totally, totally. And I think that this is something that like I find I tend to bring. Oh, and I, actually, I, I do remember what I was saying or what I was where I was going there about the elite to which anyone can be a member. Is that again with this Elder Scroll stuff? Is that there's nothing. Um, uh, that like no no one has to engage with this lore this way, right? But it is all there, and so it is kind of as again anyone can choose to be a lore enthusiast. You're just not forced to, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, I was going to say there too about um, uh, getting into the definitions and trying to rigidly define them versus talking about the capacity or the about the the capacity to debate the definitions. Is it's often something like um, uh, that I, what, when I discuss uh, Gnosticism online, I always try to emphasize the ineffability and the inability to have a, to have a single truth. Mm -hmm. um, but often a lot of the questions are, hey, is this God equal to this archon? Right. Or, 
hey, if this is true, is this true or that kind of thing? And um, uh, yeah, it is interesting. It's like, I think um, uh, I I would love to, if a game, if this if this game series, if it, if it does instill more of that, like not is this true, but more like um, is is engaging with this comparison useful? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, Do you? Well, uh, did you? Oh, yeah. no, sorry, go ahead, Nick. Oh no, well, I was, just on that behalf, I was gonna tell like one of my favorite Elder Scrolls lore things, which sort of relates to that, which is the argument that Lorcan, um, after Lorcan was killed by the other gods, or that I mean, they're not really gods, but mm-hmm. uh, but you know, when Lorcan was killed, Lorcan's corpse became the two moons that are in the game. Mm. Um, which is one it's in the text called the lunar Lorcan. And uh, the reason I thought of it in this conversation, is just because it says, you know, there's a lot of stories about what happened to Lorcan and they're all, you know, everybody picks their favorite, but my favorite is this idea that, you know, the, the dichotomy of his being kind of became the two moons. So the moon is his corpse. Mm. Um, and so that, so I just want to start that as the, the moon is the corpse of the demiurge. Let's just, <laughs> and that, you know, as one interpretation. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think, yeah, heck, that's, I, I, I can run with that. Like, I think I can make, I think I can make a solid metaphorical framework that makes that useful, if that makes okay, sense good, from yeah. a spiritual perspective. <laughs> um, I, I shouldn't say solid. I'm brainstorming this as I say it. I shouldn't say that it's solid, but I feel like there's a really compelling way to work with that, you know, like, mm-hmm. Um, if, if the earth is the thing we live on, that is both, that is both, has both life and death, um, and the moon was part of the earth, but it's now removed from us and dead. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And its gravity is kind of something that actually helps protect us by keeping us safe from meteorites, but also is a thing we need to deal with if we're ever leaving the the planet. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, there's an interesting, you can make a whole, uh, yeah, so also, like, oh, sorry, oh, yeah. I was just going to say the moon also affects the tides, which uh, like helps promote a lot of life, but also like, causes a lot of problems for things living on shores you know um, yeah so i mean it's interesting where it's like the level it's it, on one level it's very literal feeling that the that the moon would be a corpse of a deity and mm-hmm. then on another level you could see how it, it plays out in all these interesting levels of interpretation totally yeah totally um is there anything anything else on your on your uh, uh elder scrolls um you know to-do list in terms of talking about this I know. I think. I mean. I think we kind of covered it. It was really interesting to me. I didn't. I didn't know going into this how much we'd end up talking about how how uh, this level of esoteric or gnostic interpretation seems to be part of the experience of playing the game. And so mm. that's that's. I want to think more about that. But I think that was very fascinating in this conversation. Um, you know. I think. Uh, I think too. One thing we could probably do is so as this was like uh, a very surface level. I think of a lot of the games and a lot of the experiences of it, um, and it's definitely colored. I think by my own interest in uncertainty as it applies mm-hmm. to Gnosticism. Um, but uh, I think uh, I think it would definitely be smart for us to do another episode, maybe when yeah. we've both had a chance to to think more on it. Actually, to go through, uh, say for example, uh, the person on Discord to go through their. Um, their post, uh, we did see it. We didn't have a chance to internalize it fully before the show, um, and just say, okay, well, like, what? Uh, um, not taking this as the truth, but what are some interesting ideas that this takes leads us to? Um, mm-hmm. And and heck, we both need to play Starfield now. Yeah, that's the other thing I would like to do is just play <laughs> that. See how much of this act applies to that game as well, uh, and if there it, there's a Gnostic interpretation of that one. I mean, we also could do one on the Fallout series too. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Which I think, like, there's a whole other interesting thing. Like, th- that is a world where the world really is a sort of a, a you know dark prison world of negative yeah. negative yeah. elements. But, uh, um, yeah, okay, that's a whole other. Okay, maybe we've got t- at least two more shows we can do <laughs> based on yeah. this one. Yeah. Um, uh, so hey, if uh, if you're listening and you've got any thoughts of ideas we didn't cover put them in the notes in the, in the comments and, uh, or drop us a line and otherwise, yeah, we'll, um, we'll be back soon with more, uh, pop gnosis and talk gnosis. Um, uh, Nick, is there any, any links you want to give us or any notes you want to let people go with? 
Uh, not really. I mean, if anyone wants to get in contact with me, I still have a website at thelightinvisible.org, which is still my personal blog. So, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Great. Um, I uh, I don't post much on there, but I do have a, a main website, uh, jasonmemmel.com, um, if you ever want to visit that. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's it for us. So, for now... Um, be careful looking at the Elder Scrolls. They may drive you blind and uh, keep searching for Chim. Hmm. And um, yeah, join us on the next episode. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks.